Hello, uh, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. My name is Adam Hirschfelder. I'm with the uh, programming department here. It's really a pleasure uh, to have some folks here, a, li a live audience, and of course, an audience uh, online on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here. This is uh, one of our first uh, in-person programs since we reopened our building earlier in the summer. We are continuing to do some select live programs, but we're also going to be doing, of course, a huge range of programs online uh, that you can uh, find on our website at commonwealthclub.org. We thank uh, the members uh, who are here today, and we encourage you uh, to come and continue to support us during this challenging time. Of course, like the club, um, an industry that uh, has also uh, faced big challenges is the tourism industry, and that's why we're here today. We have a great panel here to discuss the challenges uh, of tourism in California, which is a critically important industry, and we couldn't be more thankful to have uh, the group we have here today. We'll learn a little bit about California tourism, tourism here in the uh, city of San Francisco, uh, from a top-down perspective as well as a bottom-up perspective because it's oftentimes we overlook the critical role of the employees that are part of tourism. So a uh, special thank you to the California Wellness Foundation, which has enabled us to provide uh, this program free, both to people on site as well as online. So with that, I want to bring up our group. No, you can, you can, <laughs> you are good. Bring up the group. <coughs> thank you. Go ahead. Is this the right seat? <laughs> Good morning and welcome everybody uh, to this morning's program, The Future of California Tourism in Challenging Times at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Spud Hilton and I spent 19 years in the travel section of the San Francisco Chronicle, including 10 as the editor there, and I'm currently the editor of Where Traveler magazine for San Francisco Bay Area, which is distributed in hotels, all of which is to say travel, tourism, and all of it are very close to my heart, and I am absolutely thrilled to be moderating this panel today with this esteemed panel. So um, a special thank you to the California Wellness Foundation for providing support for this program. We are joined today by three terrific guests who can give a terrific overview of the state of tourism in California, where we are now, and where we're headed over the coming months and years. Uh, over the past 18 months, and I think it's worth noting that this is the 540th day since the state shut down uh, last year, has been like, unlike anything the tourism industry has ever faced, and that has a tremendous impact on the state and its economy, the companies that rely on travel and tourism, and perhaps most importantly, the people employed in that industry. Here to speak about the important issues are Carolyn Batetta, the president and CEO of Visit California, a major nonprofit organization that works with the state's travel industry to inspire travel to and within California. Joe D'Alessandro, the president and CEO of SF Travel, which markets the San Francisco area as a leisure, convention, and business travel destination. And Daniela Puccinelli, director of event management at Weston St. Francis, San Francisco on Union Square, and a veteran in the tourism industry. Before we jump in, a quick note about today's format. It's worth noting that today is one of the first Commonwealth Club program on site uh, which means essentially that we not only have 
people here in San Francisco. Hello, San Francisco. Uh, but we also have viewers all around the country watching via YouTube. All of you, no matter how you are watching, can submit questions for any one of our panelists. If you are watching online, please post the questions in the chat feature, the chat feature of YouTube or Zoom. <clears throat> Those will be brought to me throughout the program. For on-site questions, please fill out the question cards that are on your seats. Okay. So let's begin. And I want to start with you, Caroline. It's Carolyn. Yes. yes Thank you. Uh, I, I did some reading lately. Uh, actually, I just Googled it and found out that apparently tourism in California is kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> To say the least. Yeah. <laughs> Could you paint a picture for us of the importance of tourism to the entire state, the current state of tourism, uh, and maybe the challenges that the state is facing now that we're already 18 months into the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question, Spud. And, and it's just interesting as we continue to go forth through this pandemic, I feel like there's a before COVID reality during and after. And, and we all preface everything we speak to in, in the tourism industries before COVID. I, I think I'll start with like really what happened. Tourism and hospitality was more affected than any other sector um, in both nationally and in California. As a matter of fact, uh, for us, and I know working with Joe D'Alessandro for years and years, we, we both experienced 9-11, which was epic. Well, this was 10 times the size of 9-11. I find it ironic that we're sitting here on today, the 20th anniversary, speaking about this. But that's the earthquake, if you will, of what happened to tourism and hospitality. Uh, overnight, California, uh, within 30 days, lost 55% of its spending and employment. Pre-COVID, it was a $145 billion a year industry that directly employed well over a million Californians. So it was in an incredibly large loss felt throughout the state. Uh, not only are our gateway cities highly reliant on tourism revenue to power city services, which Joe will talk about, but so are our rural areas and counties. Every single county, it's the number one or two uh, employment sector for all of our rural counties as well. So to say the least, it, it was certainly epic. Uh, where where we started, where we are. We're projecting a five-year recovery. Uh, a lot has come back. Uh, we're fortunate in California, actually, that we have about 79% spending here in California from Californians. Uh, but it, international and meetings and events uh, are critical to the overall health of the industry, particularly in our gateway cities like San Francisco. And so th that's where the real lag is and, and the challenges is uh, bringing back that visitor spending in those segments uh, to become whole again post-COVID. And I'll just uh, close with just to put all of these numbers in perspective. We are the number one tourism destination in the United States. We're actually uh, two and a half times the size of the Florida tourism economy and five times the size of the Hawaiian tourism economy. Could you outline what the state is doing right now to try to encourage more tourism during these times? Yeah, I think that's the good news is that our elected leaders, our governor, our lieutenant governor certainly recognized uh, the economic impacts to our local areas uh, and, and the state as a whole, as well as employment and getting people back to work. Uh, we work closely with the industry, frankly, in an ask of a $45 million stimulus because our budget is funded similar to Joe's in that uh, we have uh, the tourism industry invests like a, a local tourism improvement district. So when tourism revenues fall, our revenues fell, and we couldn't get our way out of talking about the importance of the open for business message when we did finally open up to visitors. Meanwhile, our competitive set like Florida was r running away in terms of top of mind awareness, perception of destination awareness. 
Our ask was 45 million as a one-time uh, appropriation to jumpstart this open for business message. And uh, our elected leaders came through with a $95 million stimulus. So it really speaks to the importance of the industry and the important economic fabric uh, that is tourism in California. Uh, and, and so we, we actually right now for the first time ever are running a 52 week campaign, both in state and nationally, uh, speaking to, uh, you know, prospective travelers from around the nation of, uh, come and experience California right now. And then an additional, about a $10 million label layer uh, in California, a campaign that's entitled calling all Californians. Uh, talking about the importance of choosing a California bucket list to help stimulate the economy, our neighbors, our friends. Um, what a great modern day act of patriotism to choose California to really jumpstart that. So at the appropriate time, I can even show you some of the creative we're running right now. And I bet you our viewers uh, here and in, in uh, zooming in with us uh, perhaps have seen this campaign. And I think now is the appropriate time. Great. Can we run those spots? <laughs> Thank you. This couple is working hard on, on our, our state's, state's recovery. recovery. You, you see, see, they, they live, live in California, California and, and keeping, keeping their, their vacation in California supports our small businesses and communities, which means that beautiful baby gherkin atop this charcuterie masterpiece is like another brick in the rebuilding of our economy. Job well done, friends. Calling all Californians. Keep your vacation here and help our state get back to work. And please travel responsibly. I have one more, but if you want to. No, absolutely. Too. Okay. Perhaps. <laughs> this guy here is busy working on our state's recovery. You see, he lives in California, and by vacationing in California, he's supporting our businesses and communities, which means every fruity skewer is like another sweet nail in the rebuilding of our economy. Hammer away, craftsmen. Calling all Californians. Keep your vacation here and help our state get back to work. And please, travel responsibly. I like it. I actually saw one of those this morning. Oh, good. Yeah, That's no, funny. definitely. Joe, it's your turn. Give us some insight. Uh, the importance of tourism to San Francisco, because I Googled that too, and apparently it is also a big deal here. Uh, the importance of tourism to San Francisco, how the city's been affected over the last 18 months, and some of the ways we're addressing the issue, I guess. Sure, Spud, um, and happy to talk about it. And it's great to be here to be able to share some of this information. Um, you know, leading into the pandemic, uh, tourism was San Francisco's leading industry. Um, generated about $11 billion in spending, um, almost 90,000 employees in the city of San Francisco. And visitors generated about a billion dollars in state and local, uh, local taxes that uh, San Franciscans didn't have to pay. And those taxes went uh, to pay for everything from schools and parks, police, fire, roads, you name it. And, um, and for the 10 years leading up to the pandemic, we had 10 years in a row of record-breaking growth. Our hotel occupancy and hotel revenues were tied with New York as the number one in the nation. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And today, uh, we're tied with New York as the worst performing major hotel market in the nation. And, um, and it's largely because of our, our mix. Uh, San Francisco has always been a very expensive city. 63% um, of all of our visitor spending uh, leading into the pandemic was by international visitors, whether they were here for leisure purposes or meetings and conventions, 63%. Most of our borders into the United States are closed now, and these same international visitors cannot get here. So um, San Francisco is also very dependent on the meetings and convention market. Uh, we all know that Moscone is a key revenue generator for the city. Uh, yesterday, we opened the California Dental Association, the first meeting in Moscone in 19 months. Um, uh, the Moscone has been used as a mass vaccination site, as a, um, you know, the, the center for all the emergency services during the pandemic, but now it's back to its in intended use. But for the first time uh, in many, many months, we're having uh, our convention here. And again, the 
it was ironic that the California Dental Association, the first one back after the pandemic, was also the first group that met in San Francisco after 9-11, after we had closed the convention center down in 9-11. So it's very appropriate that it was uh, the California Dental Association. So there's no question that there's a lot of people that are, remain unemployed in the hospitality industry in San Francisco. A lot of businesses have closed, um, some temporarily, some permanently. Um, you see that effects, especially when you go into parts of the, uh, the city like downtown where a lot of people are not back in their offices yet. That's still a shadow of what it was before. Still, restaurants still need to be open. However, the neighborhoods have seemed to be uh, uh, faring fine during this <laughs> period. Um, the neighborhood restaurants are very busy. Luckily, the city's taken some healthy approaches and did the parklets and the outdoor dining uh, functions. A lot of people, instead of working downtown, are working in the neighborhoods. So, um, and those restaurants were able to expand capacity during during the pandemic and and be able to open and function well. So, um, it is a it is a mixed story. It's a uh, you know depending on where you are and, and the kind of businesses you served, how you've been able to survive. But but still, we don't anticipate that San Francisco return to the levels of tourism of 2019 until probably 2025, uh, simply because the, of the, the, our market mix. Um, we are a very expensive destination. We don't have the domestic leisure travel audience that a lot of other uh, less expensive destinations in the United States have. Um, so we attract a more, uh, a, an audience that is more willing to pay our prices in San Francisco. Um, so what we're trying to do and working closely with the private sector, the hotel community, the restaurant community, and also the city to do everything we can to rejuvenate San Francisco and make it more friendly, um, make it more um, approachable to many visitors to come here. So we've been partnering a lot with Visit California. A lot of our marketing is together with Visit California. We have the same strategies. We align on uh, most all of our efforts like this. Um, we have been doing a lot of regional uh, marketing. You'll see San Francisco is busier on the weekends um, than it is during the week. Um, because the leisure travelers tend to come on the weekends. Um, during the week, we had business travels and meetings and conventions, and they're not back yet, so that's why the weekend travel is, is, um, is a little bit slower to return. Um, you know, we're going to get there. We're confident we're going to get there. We're seeing life come back. Events are happening again. Um, you know, we'll have a busy October in terms of public events with Fleet Week and the other activities that are, that are happening. Um, but it's still been devastating, and there is no other word for it but, but devastating. You know, we... In marketing, we tend to always paint a, a beautiful picture of how wonderful everything is, but we have to be real. Um, this has hit our industry, as Carolyn said, more than any other industry globally, not just in California, but globally. Um, and, uh, and it's going to take a long time to recover. And uh, we'll talk more about employees, but a lot of uh, it's going to be difficult to find employees back in the industry as we start to recover, too. So there's a lot of challenges that we face, but San Francisco is still San Francisco, and people from around the world still want to come here. Uh, time Out just picked San Francisco as the top global uh, city yesterday. And um, New York had that number one for, for a long time. And LA came in 10. So two California cities, or 11, two California cities are in the top 11 of the top global cities, which is great. It shows that people still want to come here, are very desirable. It's just going to be a while for us to get back to the level of, of travel and tourism that we were before the pandemic. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the employees and getting employees back. Uh, I think it's really easy to get lost in the numbers uh, and lose sight that employees are the ones who power the tourism industry. And uh, Daniela, if you could help us understand what's been the impact of the past 18 months on those who are employed in tourism and what are the challenges you and other employees have faced and continue to face? Um, well, as Joe had mentioned, it is devastating. We've never seen anything like this um, in our industry. Um, we've seen colleagues, friends, you know, um, laid off, um, furloughed. You know, uh, hospitality is all about service, providing an experience, and we were doing the opposite. <laughs> we were telling people, you can't come to work. I don't have work for you. So it was a different mindset. It was very uh, mentally challenging in that sense because we're there to provide an experience, and we couldn't do it. Um, I think... Um, you know, I fortunately, I've been able to work throughout the pandemic, but I'm one of the fortunate ones. But I've seen a lot of people that colleagues that have left the industry uh, because it was taking too long to come back. And they and there are a lot of talented people in our industry. So being in the San Francisco area, tech and these higher paying industries are taking the um, 
the people that can transition into an, a different field. So we're seeing that. Now that we slowly are coming back in business, um, it's hard to find people. Uh, I, you know, we had to, we've, I would say most properties in San Francisco, I would think generally have brought back everybody that's still part of their team. And now we're trying to all find new members and we're all, um, you know, vying for the same people. It's really uh, competitive out there, um, anxiously awaiting all those, you know, hospitality majors, <laughs> those students coming out of school. I think that'll be a nice <laughs> influx, you know, and then once the spring hits, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been difficult. Um, and we, um, when watching people come back to work, is interesting too, because it's a very, we have to preface it's not the same environment that you left. We are working differently. Um, people are anxious about coming back to work because they've been home and not doing anything. So there's this readjustment into coming back into work life, public life, being around a lot of people. So it's just, we all have to support one another to make sure we get through this together. And if they're anything like me, they had to go out and buy more clothes that were slightly <laughs> larger. <laughs> People are, yeah, trepidatious when they come back <laughs> and wondering if their work clothes still fit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's look at a little bit more range of tourism issues, including some of the positive sides. Um, what's been the, and this is for any of you, what's been the impact of intrastate tourism and how is it being encouraged? Happy to take that. Uh, you know, it is interesting. There, there was an opportunity uh, that hit with, you know, all of us being respectfully grounded within our countries, so to speak. Uh, our, uh, one of our leading tourism researchers at Oxford Economics had spoke about this opportunity of uh, 6 million Americans staying home uh, during the pandemic, as opposed to going to Europe, Australia, Asia. And so that, that did become an opportunity. A lot of those folks actually reside in California and they are definitely rediscovering California. Uh, and, and we hope that that will provide long-term traction that you don't have to go to, you know, Tuscany or the other wine destinations throughout the world when we have world-class wine destinations, for example, coastal destinations, et cetera. And so we, uh, you know, it's interesting how Joe mentioned where their challenges lie right now. And during this pandemic, it, it played out a little bit in terms of many of our destinations suffered from over-tourism because Californians were moving beyond the gateway cities and the capacity issues were a real challenge. But nonetheless, I, I do believe in the long term there's a silver lining about Californians getting out and discovering really anything you want to experience in the world you can experience right here. So uh, that, that's that been definitely one of the upsides. Uh, as we've run this advertising, for example, uh, already uh, on August 29th, we peaked Florida as uh, as one percentage point over, but I'll take it in terms of destination readiness and preference. And we had started far, far back in the pack with them to the point where visitor behavior trends and infrastructure, for example, airline lift had compressed here in California into California and was expanding into Florida. So this latest in terms of desirability and the aspiration of California, uh, I think will continue as we m migrate through this year. And I'll add on to that, that before the pandemic, New York was San Francisco's number one market. Uh, today, Los Angeles is our number one market and Sacramento is our number two market. Wow. So it tells you how dy the dynamics have changed dramatically and in-state uh, travel becomes really important to us right now. Anything to add, Daniela? Or I know it's sort of the big picture. Yeah, I mean, I would say during the, um, when we were a little more shut down, uh, we did see a lot of locals. We talked talk to them as we're bringing them into the hotel. Where are you from? Oh, San Jose, uh, Santa Rosa. We needed to get out of the house. Um, and there wasn't much to do in San Francisco, but they were on a high floor of a building and, <laughs> and they just needed to see something different. <laughs> nice. Nice. I know I've been doing some of that too, discovering my own backyard. Uh, Joe and Carolyn, when do you expect to see 
you know, it's all gradual. Well, when do you expect to see sort of significant signs of recovery? Well, June 14th, we expected to see significant signs of recovery <laughs> today. Um, you know, it's really hard to project. And, um, and you know, when these companies in, in the travel industry are doing budgeting, right now it's just a guess what's going to happen next year. We didn't anticipate the Delta variant to be as impactful globally as it was. Um, you know, we're looking at this fall is going to be soft. Um, uh, currently in San Francisco, our convention and meeting calendar for 2022 is pretty robust. Um, but it was pretty robust this fall, too, and that changed. Um, so, again, we're not going to see total recovery, we don't think, until 2025. We hope to be surprised and it to be better than that. But a lot of uh, domestic experts are predicting it won't be until the second half of next year that we start to see a more robust recovery. And just tracking with that, what what we've seen all along is what we're calling that dimmer switch or a jagged recovery, uh, two steps forward, one step back, as a matter of fact. So, as he said, the the you know the future looks bright in terms of you know regional travel, but it's the the longer haul travel that really brings in those dollars to these communities that are really important. We're not discounting regional travel, but really to become whole and and that's where we get this situation of a jagged recovery. Joe and I were just talking this week earlier about the fact that that the, our our forecasters were revising those numbers downward because of delta as he said delta really you know has created a delta in the short term for us and uh it just was unexpected i think it, you know we all just wanted to get out and get this behind us this has been epic for all of us in our lives and uh, i think june 14th we thought we'd never be really looking back but it, it's we're as we all say we're going to have to learn to live with this and and that creates uh an interesting situation as well and I want to add that our industry understands the importance of following COVID protocol. We encourage people to be vaccinated. We encourage people to wear masks. That's the only way we're going to get through this, is if people practice these protocols. San Francisco has the strictest COVID protocols in the country. Most of our meeting customers think it's fine. Um, they'd rather have a safe meeting than a meeting that's not safe. So it's really important that people get vaccinated if we want to get this economy going again, because we're just going to have starts and stops and stalls that, and, until people get vaccinated and we can get this under control. Uh, uh, just one more point on that. Sure. Um, travel's leading the way. Uh, right now, nationally, 81% of travelers are actually vaccinated, fully vaccinated versus 50%. So, you know, I, I really feel like I'm part of a big Bigger movement, frankly, than just being in the travel business per se, you know, reflecting on all of society. Yeah, that's great. Um, Daniela, is there an upside? Uh, will the hospitality, in, hospitality industry and the people who work in it come out stronger, maybe changed for the better in some way when we get to the other side of this? Yeah, I would think so. I, I think so. I think um, we definitely have had to pull together and, and um, work more as a team and support one another through this um, and versus being in our silos of, you know, housekeeping is over here, restaurants are over here, banquets is here. You know, we all are in it together, so to speak. And I think the way we do business daily is a little different where in our industry, pre-pandemic cleaning was always behind the scenes. You shut the door. Mm -hmm. Like I know in a banquet room, I never wanted I'd shut the door and we'd clean. Well, now we clean in front. We want people to see us cleaning. So it, it gives um, reassurance that it makes people feel comfortable. So that's a whole new mindset for us that we're cleaning. You know, if someone stands up, we go and we clean um, or we keep the doors open. And so I think that's a good thing, definitely. Um, and I, in any time that there's a downturn in the economy, the social market is what will come back first, and that's what we're seeing, seeing these people that have had to postpone their weddings three times. You know, they're still having, they're coming in on the weekends and doing weddings, the anniversaries, the so, people want to celebrate special events. So we're, we're seeing that slowly come back, and I thought, too, with the mask mandate, the vaccination mandate, we would lose that business, but people are, no, let's move forward, we'll deal with it, we're all vaccinated. Um, and we need to celebrate. People want to, you know, get through this. Uh, it's going to take a lot longer than we would like, as Joe mentioned. It's a, it's, it's disheartening to hear. <laughs> like I'm thinking mm, four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, um, yeah, no, I think we'll definitely be 
be better operators out of all this and co-workers to each other. Okay. Other than the pandemic itself, are there other issues that are working against a speedy recovery? And what's helping? Labor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, across the country, even hospitality has been one of the hardest hit areas. We're hearing about labor shortages in all sectors, but hospitality has been hit extraordinarily hard. Uh, Joe actually just became our chief financial officer. He's part of our officers of our 37 member board. And we had met earlier in the week with our other officers, one who's running Universal Studios and a couple of other attractions, Dan Gordon, Gordon Biersch, and that's in their frontal lobes. It's all about labor. So I, I will say that it, it is interesting to see the patience and tolerance of prospective visitors in understanding this from a global perspective. I only think you get a honeymoon for so long, but for the most part, I think uh, patrons just appreciate businesses being open and trying their hardest in terms of service levels, and, and that's really heartening. Okay. Another thing, uh, supplies. Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Basic supplies have been tough, and we have to pre-plan so much further to make sure we can get, you know, beef and chicken and um, just the base Kleenex and just the basics. Like, um, you know, you hear about the car industry and the chips, and it's yeah. I mean, it's it's tough to get supplies Af after labor. It's supplies. Huh. That that's <laughs> news to me. I, d I did not know that. I mean, I knew I couldn't get Fresca in the store, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I didn't know about uh, that hotels would have that problem. Yep. Uh, sort of a last question from me, uh, almost last question. What's important for California citizens to understand about tourism and maybe what can people watching this, both live and on YouTube, do to assist you in, in your jobs? Let me start with that one. Um, because I feel really passionate about this. I think that, you know, we all love to travel and we've heard about, Danielle mentioned that people just want to get out of their house after being stuck in there and they know how important and liberating travel is and how it opens minds and opens the world and uh, to people. But, and we all want to go to these exotic places, but you know, for the time being, let's focus on California right now. Let's, um, let's spend our money and keep our own businesses operating, keep our small businesses. Most of San Francisco's tourism economy are mom and pop small businesses, small restaurants. It's not the huge, you know, we don't have casinos and big theme parks in San Francisco. It's, it, they go to the neighborhoods. They go to the same businesses that we support. We need to make sure these businesses can make it through these times. So instead of necessarily going somewhere else, spend your money in California, support your local businesses. That's absolutely critical during this time because if they can get it through it then they can be survive and be healthy and not only our industry but the economy and the very spirit of our communities can survive but we have to make sure we can do everything possible to make our california businesses survive during this period and if we can i think it's going to be a much brighter future for all of us Yes, and just doubling down on that, supporting our businesses and our destinations and our urban cores. That's where the business, you know, where we need that business the most. Uh, in addition to that, is as you saw perhaps on some of the advertising we're running, uh, it's really important for us to emphasize traveling responsibly, not only from a safety protocol perspective for you and the guests and our employment base to keep those you know employees safe, but also uh, from an environmental standpoint when uh, you know you're out wandering around and an economic uh, economic standpoint, as we said, uh, during COVID, we, well, right before COVID, we had uh, drafted a, a California sustainability plan around travel. We thought that would just be on the shelf when we went into COVID, but we quickly pulled it off the shelf because many of our destinations outside the gateways, as I said, were getting visitors for the first time. So, you know, we had people going up uh, I-80 and I-50 corridors to Lake Tahoe uh, without, you know, chains in the winter and appropriate tires or just pulling over the side of the road and throwing out sleds. It, it was a danger for people that were sledding next to a freeway, for example. So there's, there's responsible ethics around keeping yourself, your family safe. 
the tourism community, but also just be thinking about even the as simple as an Instagram shot. Many, you know, many people flock to iconic destinations uh, throughout California, many here in San Francisco, but but when you're trying to get that shot, think about the business that's operating right behind you and make sure you walk in there and, and grab a cup of coffee or a Diet Coke because they're all using their bathrooms, facilities, and they need that business too just to stay alive. So it's really about responsible travel on so many dimensions that, that you may be out of your neighborhood, but you're in somebody else's neighborhood. And, and we really are a global community at this point. I... I've been a strong advocate to get rid of the word staycation. As a travel editor, I hated the idea. <laughs> it was, it's, a, it's a terrible word. However, in this particular case, is are we relying to some extent on the staycation for hotels and hospitality? Oh, obviously, yeah, especially with the international market not being... Um, around and to support us and we definitely see during the week in San Francisco the decline in occupancy and then the weekend um, every and the um, the drive-in market I just found out this last uh, Labor Day weekend at our hotel we had the highest revenue in parking ever hmm. and that's because of the drive-in market Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I have a personal anecdote on this several years ago. My husband and I were building a house in the Sierra foothills, um, but we just wanted to get away. And as crazy as it sounds, we drew, drove like 20 minutes up the road to stay the night all weekend in a B and B in Grass Valley. <laughs> and so we go up there at night and have a great dinner and spend the night. And then the morning we come back and work on this house, like hard labor. And it was one of the most delightful weekends ever. I mean, don't discount the fact that, you know, these nearby destinations, or if you're living somewhere that's even not in downtown San Francisco, but, you know, 20 minutes away, you, you can do it without doing it. And it's, it just is that change of scenery. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, Joe, you mentioned uh, the local business, especially the small mama pops. One of my fears at the beginning of this thing was that the kind of places, businesses that make the personality of a place are the ones that we're going to be least likely to be able to survive. Is that still a concern? You know, it, it was a concern in the very beginning. In fact, there was some estimates that we could lose as many as 50% of our restaurants in San Francisco. Um, luckily, uh, things happened. The city took charge. The mayor did some things like the parklets and the outdoor dining, which saved hundreds, if not thousands of restaurants from closing. So um, if we didn't do action, if we didn't make some steps that would change that, we would be in a much worse uh, shape than we are now. Now, when people come to San Francisco, you go to North Beach on a you know evening, and there these restaurants are open. This Grant is full of people sitting outside. It's busier and more lively than it was before the pandemic. So some of these changes are permanent. They're going to be very helpful for our neighborhoods, especially. And um, and so yes, we can do things to make things better. And I think San Francisco has done that. I think uh, you know being the first in the nation to go into lockdown was scary for us because we didn't know what that meant. But it all, we also have one of the lowest death rates in the world right now the COVID and one of the lowest infection rates in the world. And 80, over 80% 80 of all eligible people are vaccinated in San Francisco. It's pretty amazing. Um, so, you know, we're just telling the world that San Francisco is a safe place to come to. It's a safe place to come. You have to, we ask people to sign our pledge that says you'll follow our protocols when you come to San Francisco and, and travel here. And, um, but it is that we're marketing as a safe place to come to because we were strict and we, we followed these codes and, and based on science and knew it, knowing that that was the best way to keep our city and our industry alive. That's great. That's great. I have a number of questions, some from online and some from here. Um, let's see. Upon or perhaps in preparation for opening borders, what do you see as the most critical steps in restoring international visitation to California and San Francisco? Yeah, I think, you know, our country is working bilaterally with some of our major markets, those being Canada, Mexico, the UK, Germany, Japan, China, Australia, to name a few. 
We had 14 international offices uh, up and running before COVID. Those are right now on suspense, but it, it depends on the country. Um, Canada had a threshold of their own vaccination rate, and so they finally opened on August 9th, re reaching that vaccination rate. Uh, Mexico, actually, their airline lift is running at about the same schedule as it was co pre-COVID at this point. But for example, Beijing, uh, China, uh, our largest international market, including San Francisco's largest international market, you know, they're, they want to make sure they deliver an Olympic experience. So we really don't see that market coming back until post-Olympics. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, big markets for us. Uh, they're looking at this internally, uh, as you know, so we're not looking to them until late 2022 in terms of openings as well. Japan, uh, we're hoping that's a mid-market. The Japanese Association of Travel uh, 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 travel agents are asking people not to travel and they're encouraging their clientele not to travel, for example, through the fall and then reassessing on January 1st. So depending on the market and the protocols, um, and we, particularly in Japan, we work cooperatively with that association uh, because they view safety as paramount in their culture. We, um, before the pandemic, our top mark, number one market was, was China. Uh, overseas market, and then it would jump back and forth between Europe and Asia. Um, what we're anticipating now is that Europe is going to recover faster than Asia. And um, United is our largest single carrier, and SFO is their uh, Asian uh, gateway, and that's going to hurt us um, with a slower Asian recovery. We're, we're, we anticipate that most of our European service at, at SFO will be coming back. Um, we were the fastest growing large airport in the United States leading up to it. Most of it was international. Most of it was a lot of uh, international carriers that uh, many of which have suspended service right now, but we're starting to hear their plans to return and start service again. Um, and again, I think Europe is going to come back first and Asia is going to lack, lack them and Australia will, will lag behind a, a bit in order to come back to its full force. Okay. Um, Danielle, I think this is probably for you. What's the most effective way a hotel can reduce guests' fears prior to their booking a stay? Ooh, good question. <laughs> well, most hotel companies uh, have uh, new cleaning protocols, um, and they are listed on all their our website, their corporate, you know, company websites. I know that um, we at our hotel we do send out a letter a pre-arrival letter so that we um, alert the guests what the protocols are to be in the hotel because we you know the mask mandate if they're eating and dining you need to be vaccinated so and then we go over the um, steps that we've taken um, in in terms of cleaning and um, keeping the um, space safe and stuff so i think that's important. Uh, when it comes to meeting and events, we, uh, we also have um, the protocols that we're doing and we get a lot of questions about that and we send all the different um, steps that we're taking, whether it's public space, private sp in the meeting space, and in the sleeping rooms where, um, you know, we're giving, um, we're, we added hand san um, sanitizer packets into the guest rooms. I've been in hotels where, you know, the, um, Remote control is covered. There are new apps now where you can make your phone your remote control. So there's a lot of technology that's coming into the industry too to make people feel more comfortable and safe to travel. I know the cruise industry is, yeah. is doing a lot along those lines with an app that will unlock and lock your door, turn on your lights, right. all the touch points. Right, in the room keyless, en like keyless entry um, is very important big now amongst all the brands where you don't have to come and get a key for the front desk um, and you don't even have to come to the front desk. So just a lot of seamless, you know, making it seem more seamless for the traveler. All right. Um, I think I'm understanding this question. Uh, is there something that California can learn from all the people visiting Hawaii? Are there lessons there for California? I'm reading that exactly as it is. I'm interpreting that, I believe, as Hawaii had to sort of re-shut down a lot of its stuff, and then the governor actually encouraged people to stay home. Don't come here. Uh, 
I believe that's what the question is aimed at. What lessons can we learn from that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think from a global perspective, we're watching other destinations too. I'm making an assumption I'll answer it from the perspective of not only safety, but even over tourism. And then the vital protection of healthcare infrastructure, you know, making sure that there's enough beds to service those that are infected if there's an outbreak in Hawaii, for example, or here. Uh, so it, it really is, to Joe's point, is encouraging, continuing to cur encourage vaccination and safety protocols, uh, which I feel like California leads uh, definitely in the nation, if not the world, on that front, uh, as well as continuing to echo that amongst the travel community. You know, 81% is great compared to the Delta, 50% America, but why not continue to push uh, more vaccinations to keep people safe. And then in California alone, you know, we do have this very checkered recovery, as I said. And so our, our new normal is really looking at spreading the love, if you will, and looking at times where there, there were times where San Francisco was at capacity, for example, pre-COVID. Now San Francisco needs the love. So a lot of our promotional efforts are driven toward those principal gateway cities of LA and San Francisco, while some areas are at capacity. Yosemite is a great example of being at capacity during the normal season. We don't promote Yosemite, and we work with them cooperatively when it makes sense to promote Yosemite, for example. So really looking at the visitor patterns as almost yield management. You, uh, Joe can speak to the fact that, that you've done that also in the city with you know Lombard Street, et cetera to make sure that that we look at visitor promotion differently than just destination marketing. We're now evolving into destination management mm -hmm. so that not only the visitor has a great experience, but the community sees the benefit of travel. That's where we're really pushing in this new normal. You know, we don't... Um... In, in San Francisco, when we look at the growth of the visitor industry, we don't look at numbers of tourists. We look at economic impact. Um, the reason is it's better for us to have a visitor stay longer than have twice as many visitors come. And so our focus is to have a positive experience for the visitor and for the resident, as Carolyn said. So um, we did not want to see an experience where people would go to Lombard Street and wait two hours and then, and then the neighborhood, the neighbors not be happy and people get their cars broken into and all this kind of stuff. That doesn't work for anybody. So we'd rather much more, as Carolyn said, focus on the management so that the experience somebody has when they come here is a positive one. And I think that can be done and we're going to be planning on and focusing on that as we recover so that we can recover better than we were before. No, oh, that's, that's great. Um, we have, you mentioned a California bucket list. <laughs> I, I love this question. Uh, could, uh, could you each give one place on your California bucket list and why? Well, California is my bucket list. <laughs> Very, very political, very <laughs> diplomatic answer there. Oh, and I'm I'm in one of my bucket list destinations right now, and and thank you for saying that. Yes, there. absolutely. And and for the record, I was walking over with one of our other colleagues and saying how delightful this is. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just beautiful right now because people, you know, you, I mean, the the streets are gorgeous, and and there's just. I don't know. There just seems to be a new emergence. Even walking over this morning was just, you know, a lovely experience. Uh, the good news about Californians, I, I expect that most people uh, tuning into this are Californians. And, and I think that's the great news is whether you're interested in wine country, the Sierras, uh, our deserts, 1,200 miles of ocean. It's just it, it, anywhere you want to go is great. A treasure of, of attractions and outdoor experiences, and of course, these iconic and now very popular uh, urban centers, um, according to Time Out. That's, that's great, I didn't know about it, so. I'll just add, I've been fortunate to be almost everywhere in California. I've never been to Death Valley National okay, Park. Okay, me too. <laughs> and, so that's, on my, that's my, probably my highest on the bucket list is getting to Death Valley. 
Uh, no Death Valley for me. I just want <laughs> <laughs> But in the wintertime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to go now. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's no concierge <laughs> at Death Valley. Yeah. So. Yeah. I want to be by the <laughs> ocean and hear the waves and just have some time off. Any specific spots? Mm, where I can get a good rate. <laughs> ah, that's Santa, Santa Tully, right? <laughs> well said. Well said. Uh, what kind of questions, this is, uh, again, from a, from a viewer, what kind of questions are each of you encountering from people who want to visit California or stay in hotels or come to San Francisco? You know, are you, what's open? You know, and that was the question, especially, you know, uh, when we started to reopen, people want to know, are your attractions open? Are your museums open? Can I find a restaurant? All those types of things. Now, people understand that m most things are open. Most uh, museums that they know of, most attractions are open. But um, the other question is, is it safe? You know, what are you doing? What steps are you taking to ensure my safety when I come here? And, and for San Francisco, we're really proud of, you know, from the moment you fly into SFO to when you check into the hotel to, to, to you go to an attraction, our protocols are, are the, at the highest level in the world basically. And so we're proud of that. So we can, we can say how uh, we believe a, a visit to San Francisco uh, will be a positive uh, one and it'll be a safe one too. I think in addition to that, sometimes the industry really struggles with the difference in county by county regulations, which is confusing to the traveler. So I, I get a lot of questions from the industry saying, can we get to a point where we're back to a California standard? Because it puts a burden on our staff employees that directly interface with the customer. So that's something that's really frustrating and, and something that we'll, we'll see, you know, where our elected officials go, both on a regional and statewide basis. Well, yeah. a, a follow-up for that, and I, I still want to hear your answer. Do you think we'll get to a California standard, and what would that take? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, we had it uh, going, we, well, going into COVID, it became countywide, I think we all experienced the frustration of it being differing and then and then kind of there was this lifting of standards and now with Delta going back to those um, enhanced safety protocols, but differing. And, you know, I, I'm reluctant to there. There's areas that have no outbreaks in California. There's areas that are, you know, it's kind of, you know, a checkered board, but at the end of the day, while Delta is raging throughout the country, it, it certainly is helpful for consumers and employees, given labor shortages, et cetera, to have some sort of standardization in those protocols. So we've done it before. Uh, it, it certainly can happen again. And Daniela, um, what kind of questions are your people fielding? Uh, what are the mandates for San Francisco? Uh, we have to explain the vaccination, and, and that's a key one about, re, you know, if you're going to dine inside or go to a bar, that's that's really a big one for us right now. Uh, and also what is, um, for the groups or the, uh, the social events, what is the hotel doing to um, address the COVID situation and, and protocols that were are in place? Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm going to come back to you with another question from a viewer. What is the current morale of frontline hospitality workers uh, eager to get back to normal, burned out? You know, is there a is there uh, an issue there? Yeah, it's a it's a little of both. Um, there's some of us that have um, worked throughout the pandemic, and um, those those are the ones you might see that are on the more burnt out side. Um, but I think the the ones coming back recently, there's, I've seen a change in a, um, attitude and willingness to be more of a team and excited to be back at work and doing things that maybe they weren't going to do, do previous. So I think there's excitement to come back to work. Um, and it's just, it's, we just asked to that we, you know, a lot of, uh, hospitality and businesses aren't at full 100% capacity. Not everything is open uh, due to occupancy, due to staffing, due to, s to resources. So just being kind to those of us in the industry that um, 
because I, I, I go into some restaurants and I see, you know, we're all in this together, be kind, and it just brings a smile to my face. We have to remember that. Um, there are reasons why businesses are operating in a certain fashion or a certain way, and just being respectful and kind that we're, you know, we're all trying to provide a service in a difficult time. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I know the answer to this, if it's a yes or no question, but... <sighs> How has, well, it's not. How has the drought, wildfires, and other climate issues uh, affected San Francisco tourism and California tourism? And we'll say hospitality, too. Well, you know, obviously we're very concerned about climate change and what it's going to do not only to tourism, but to people who live not only in California, but anywhere. I mean, it's impacting, you know, the, the, the whole world. And, um, and I think we all have a responsibility uh, to address it in a meaningful way. Um, we have not seen significant um, fallback yet because of fires and, and drought, um, but we could. And, um, and that could be just another hamper to our, uh, damper to our recovery. And uh, so we are obviously very concerned about it. There's no question that the brand of California, and Carolyn is going to be more able to address this, is being hit hard with the drought stories and the fire stories and, and all this other stuff. It, um, you know, we are the golden state, and California dreaming was always the essence. And, you know, part of what Visit California does is to kind of recreate that California dreaming and, and to think about California in this aspirational destination level. Yeah, and just to follow on what Joe was saying, we definitely have seen, we do global focus group studies every year looking at our brand, and there has definitely been uh, some brand tarnish as it relates to, you know, just annual hits with drought and wildfire. Uh, there, there's some positives and silver linings that come out of that in terms of California leading the way in terms of climate change mitigation. Uh, that's certainly helpful for our brand, but it's, it, it's, it's a longer term tenant versus the reality of what's happening real time. Uh, we, we know that our advertising definitely helps stem the tide of, of brand tarnish because we can communicate uh, unlike you know media outlets that will show a fire that's it's as if it's raging throughout California or earthquakes, et cetera. Um, we try to communicate the facts for travelers of impacted areas and corridors uh, or fires that might have been really a natural phenomenon. That's our, our new narrative, which shouldn't have to be a narrative because it's real. Wildfire is a naturally occurring phenomenon, just like there's a hurricane season. So that that's helping some. The hardest challenge we have around dealing with uh, natu natural phenomena is the media loves to cover California five times to the degree of other states. So right. you've got a situation with Washington, Oregon, that those fires broke out first there, for example, this year. They had wildfires last year, even British Columbia, Canada, and yet the media um, is in love with covering California. Uh, and we'll ignore wildfires somewhere else, just as one example. So we are in the spotlight, and and from a negative standpoint, because media loves negative news, that that is a harder fight for us. I, I think, uh, Daniela, maybe this would be an opportunity to say, how does uh, climate change and conservation fit into the hospitality business plan? Oh, as operators, it's it's a huge component of um, uh, making a green decision. Every hotel company has uh, ways where you don't um, have your room cleaned every night. That saves on washing linens and towels and such. Um, the you know managing the water, the power in the building. I'm, I'm glad I don't have that responsibility. <laughs> um, but the, I, yeah, just with the drought and the water in the building. I mean, we have a almost 1,200 hotel rooms, so that I can only imagine, and you can't control what the individual is doing in the room, and we've all been guilty, like, oh, it's not my house, and you leave the lights on, and out the door you go, so <laughs> it's, um, there's that that we have to, you know, manage more so, but um, I think the, we can do, we've done a lot in the hotel industry about, say, in, in regards to um, the guests participating and being a part of being green. We can offer it to our group guests as well. And so then that way too, um, people feel like they're doing a little 
you know, doing some good for the environment. That's great. Good. I, um, yeah, Joe, I think this is probably mostly uh, on you. Can you comment on plans to clean up this uh, San Francisco to encourage tourism to return? Sorry, there's a, a handwriting issue here. <laughs> to encourage tourism to return. We all read negative news. It must have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. And I imagine it's, I know at one point, and I hate to even bring it up, I know at one point, New York Times, in all of its high and mightiness, uh, <laughs> declared us, you know, San Francisco as being one of the dirtier cities. There were, they talked about the tenderloin, things like that. I guess what they're asking is, is there a concerted effort to do that while we're waiting for tourism to return? Absolutely. I mean, I mean you know, the uh, cleanliness and safety are the two key issues that people think about when they go to a destination, especially an urban destination. And, um, and although San Francisco has had challenges, so does most other cities. So when we, we look back at some of the media um, uh, <laughs> negative stories about San Francisco, we often find that they go towards media sources that don't like San Francisco's politics. Right. And, and, and those really amplify this story. And what, you know, not, not, not making a political statement, it's, a, it's just a fact. There's certain media outlets that hate the word San Francisco, and, uh, or the two words, and um, like they hate New York or Los Angeles, and, or California, honestly. And so they'll pick on us more than they will pick on other places. That being said, we do have some issues, um, and uh, we've been working very closely, both the public sector and the private sector, working closely together. Um, San Francisco has now a billion dollars um, focused on helping house and helping people who are forced to live on the streets. We were very concerned that the numbers of people living on the streets would have increased uh, dramatically during the pandemic because people losing their jobs and the ability to stay in their homes. Um, some measures has helped to mitigate that. But uh, cleanliness is, is a real key thing. So we've been working very closely with the city, uh, the establishment of uh, community uh, benefit districts and business improvement districts that help clean up the neighborhoods. We have a brand new one right here in downtown that just started uh, last year. So there are a lot of efforts being made to make sure that the city uh, looks good and is safe for people. And we realize that's going to be really important. I honestly believe that the city is cleaner today than it was as we got into the pandemic, and I'm walking the streets of San Francisco all the time. Uh, we still have a challenge with uh, p unhoused people that we need, to, we have a responsibility as a society. It's not San Francisco's responsibility to solve uh, this issue. It's, uh, it's society's responsibility, and it can't be done city by city. It has to be done by the state and then a national government to do that, because um, it is a national problem. Um, but we are taking steps, and um, I I only can have confidence that these steps will help to improve the situation as we go forward. Good. I, uh, as I understand it, um, the city itself is putting a billion dollars mm -hmm. into working yep. with homelessness and things like that, as well as starting some other programs. Um, and this is my question, not the, the viewer's question, but is there something to be said for making those improvements while we have the chance, Absolutely. while there's less tourism, so that it, it is a better place not only for the visitor, but also for the resident. Is that... Absolutely, and you know, we uh, passed uh, Measure C a few years ago that uh, raised um, 300 and something million dollars a year to, to deal with uh, fighting the situation on the streets and providing services to people that are uh, in desperately in need to it. And so we have resources now that we did not have uh, going into the pandemic. The city won the lawsuit that they can spend that money. And this is all new. This didn't happen two years ago or three years ago. Those resources were not available. Money doesn't solve all problems, but it does help. And so I believe that having these resources now that we didn't have before the pandemic will help the situation. Okay. I, I think this was already addressed, but I'm going to ask this again if there's anything to add to this. Do you think vaccine mandates like the one in SF and you know, around the state will help the tourism businesses? I think the issue around safety is paramount and vaccines are the primary tool in the long-term fight against COVID. So we've seen in our research, uh, actually, that's just coming out that, and, and Joe mentioned this as well, but from a California perspective, that visitors uh, are more uh, interested at this point in visiting destinations that 
not, I mean, perceived as safe or are safe. And the number one indicator uh, right now in terms of consumer sentiment about, around safety is vaccination rates. And really that part of the core DNA uh, for communities it, it, being vaccinations is really, really important. I think we need to get out more information about the fact that there's this mass uh, disproportionately higher vaccine rate uh, amongst travelers so that travelers will just feel more comfortable as they're getting to that destination, moving through airports. It's a lot more safe to be inside an airplane than our own household, for example. We need to get out that, the, that sort of information about the safetiness of not only the traveler um, and, and the facilities we use to get to a destination, but then the destination itself or the community for that matter. You know, it's really unfortunate that, that this vaccination has become so politicized. Um, you know, we were used to getting vaccinations our whole lives and there's vaccination requirements to go to schools and there have been since, you know, I was you know, going to school. I remember getting, you know, my shots at school in, in fact, and all of a sudden this has gotten politicized, which is ridiculous. It's just a health issue. And it's just trying to stop a p global pandemic that is killing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And um, it's just common sense to take precautions, not only to protect yourselves, but to protect others. Okay. All right. Um, it looks like we've only got a couple minutes left. And so I'm going to ask one last question. Uh, you might have to, because I could not read the... <laughs> I have traveled a lot in my business. I would stay at Century Plaza Hotel uh, in L.A. Boulevard. Um, I know at the time there were lots of Saudi Arabians, Middle Eastern people, well off. On occasion, a princess took the whole top floor of the hotel. Second floor empty for security purposes. Briefly. Can I, can I answer Please that? Please do. Yeah, um, I, I'm glad you answered that. As a matter of fact, you know, there, there was that point where it was about anti-Trumpism or whatever. And actually, uh, I, I feel we prevailed for, for, for a couple reasons. One, just the facts in terms of post 9-11, we've done very well with the Middle Eastern market, uh, they're luxury travelers. You described it beautifully, on point, uh, important part of our mix for sure. And we've encouraged that. Um, when, when we saw some of that rhetoric get what we felt dangerously out of line or out of alignment with our core values, for example, I turned to Joe and we partnered with our other gateway cities as well as the mayors of those cities and actually conducted an all dreams welcome mission to Canada, Mexico, and then even into the Middle East. So we've been very active uh, of how we've even changed our marketing to more diplomatic missions coming out of that to ensure that we are frankly perceived and because the reality is we are welcoming and we know from our research that, that we index higher than other states and destinations on that front. I don't. Yeah, and it's know. absolutely critical for the travel industry to be the leaders in making people feel welcome, no matter who they are, what their background is, what their sexual orientation is, where they come from, what their religion is. We have to welcome them in their in their community. And and honestly, most people look beyond who the president is and th look at who the yeah. people are. And if they feel that they're welcome when they come here by meeting people in the streets or in hotels, they're going to be fine about it. They they look, you know, whoever the president is, is going to last a short time. It really are uh, the American people welcoming. So that's what we in the hospitality industry really focus on is making sure people feel welcome when they come to California. 
we actually even opened an office in the Middle East before COVID because it was such an important market for us. Okay, briefly, because uh, we're, we're running up against a time limit here. Uh, all of us has heard or said hundreds of times over the last 18 months, uh, the phrase, the new normal. <laughs> I know I've said it more times than I can count. What are some of the new normals for the tourism industry, both good and bad? I'll start. Um, for us in San Francisco, you know, there, you know, there is no normal. I just want to say, because <laughs> what's going to, it's going to be like in six well, months is going to be different than it's like now. And, and we don't know what that's going to be. 12 months is going to be different. But one thing that we have done and kind of how we communicate what San Francisco is all about is talk a lot more about our outdoor experiences because people want to do that. You know, we have one of the most attended national parks in the country, in the city of San Francisco, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And the abilities for people to walk around our neighborhoods or go to Golden Gate Park or go to the Presidio or Alcatraz or the Marin headlines. It's incredible what we have here in terms of an outdoor experience in San Francisco. And most people think of us as a city, you know, concrete jungle, everything's indoor, but no, so that's changed. So I think our visitors are going to be experiencing more of not only the indoors, but the outdoors, not only in a rural community, but in an urban community. And I think things like that, people are going to eat outdoors more. You're going to see more performances outdoors, more, more festivals and stuff that will t have more of an outdoor element. Those are things that are changing that will become normal, that we're not necessarily normal before the pandemic will become part of who we are as a destination. Daniela, any new normals? Uh, well, as mentioned previously, I think uh, cleaning protocols and um, the way we go about doing that in the in the hotel industry, being more upfront about it and visible about it throughout the building, uh, I think that'll um, that will stay with us. I think when it comes to events, um, cust uh, customizing it for what the customer's comfortable with versus we used to be like, okay, you're gonna have three people at a six foot table. Um, no, now it's, well, what, what are you comfortable with? What are your guests comfortable with? Um, so I think we're gonna have to um, tailor our meetings around um, that and, and the group that's in house. I think that'll be a new a mindset for us. And, um, and I, and I think, you, you know, like we have the, you know, the shields at the front desk that those, who knows, those may never go away, you know, just little things like that, just to make the employee as well as the customer feel a little bit safer. Carol? Yeah, I'll just end by saying crisis is not competition. And our industry has really pulled together this collaboration of competitors to look at long-term resilience. So that's a new normal is if we can survive something that was 10 times the impact of 9-11 by working together, um, that speaks well of the future. On the consumer front, we, we are all marching together on this idea of responsible tourism. So while this has been disastrous, the pandemic on businesses and human lives, I think that we will be in a better place of sharing the, this history and culture and these experiences, but sharing them responsibly, that's critical. And I'm really excited about kind of transforming that with partners like Joe and Daniela and others coming out of this. And that's a great way to end it. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left. Uh, I know we could have gone much longer clearly on this topic. Carolyn, Joe, Daniela, thank you for your time today. You uh, can learn more about Visit California at visitcalifornia.com and SF Travel at sftravel.com. Uh, we um, thank you to all our viewers today, including Commonwealth Club members. Another special thanks to the California Wellness Foundation for its support for this program. I'm Spud Hilton, and now the meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>